1953, the British military began experimenting with ways of using jets to create vertical lift. The result, the extraordinary flying bedstead. Flying bedstead basically was a frame with an engine and a pilot on it, and basically it produced enough lift to get it in the air and prove the concept that if you put enough thrust behind a brick, you can get it airborne. Using the exhaust from the jet to produce lift and further exhaust nozzles pointing sideways to control the machine, the bedstead rose eight feet off the ground, hovering for eight and a half minutes. The race was now on to produce an operational vertical takeoff fighter. In the first serious tests, engineers sat the planes on their tails, treating them more like rockets. Of course, the pilot's looking up and has no idea where the ground is or what's going on behind him. So uh, takeoffs are one thing, but landings are certainly another thing. Control was the main problem facing the designers. How to translate from vertical takeoff to horizontal flight and then back again to the vertical mode for landing. But lessons had been learned with the flying bedstead. Using the exhaust system to create lift, Sir Sidney Cam, designer of the Hawker Hurricane, was able to create the world's first vertical takeoff fighter, the Harrier. If you want to do a vertical takeoff, you move the nozzle lever in the cockpit backwards, that points the nozzles down at the ground. Then, if you open the throttle, the exhaust comes out here and lifts the aircraft up off the ground. When you got it off the ground and you then want to accelerate the aeroplane, you take the nozzle lever and you just push it slowly forward and you're swiveling the nozzles around until it's in conventional flow. The system was called Vector Thrust and used the exhaust to create lift and forward movement. It also solved the problem of controllability. Exhaust nozzles on the nose and wings enabled the pilot to maneuver his plane in any direction. Sir Sidney's design became known as the Harrier Jump Jet. On land, it didn't need a runway. At sea, the danger of takeoff was reduced. Only one question remained. How would it perform in combat? In the 1980s, the Harrier cut its teeth in the Falklands, protecting the British Navy's fleet as it tried to take back the islands from the Argentines. In Operation Desert Storm, the U.S. Marine Corps' Harriers became the most forward deployed strike fighter, launching every 23 minutes during the ground offensive. Freed from the shackles of runways, jump jet technology revolutionized fixed wing versatility. Harrier drops in a farmer's field, Harrier refuels, rearms, Harrier pops up into the sky, and Harrier is once again providing intimate fire support and the fighter ground attack role for ground troops. This new technology also gave the Harrier a tactical edge in aerial engagements. With vectored thrust, you can put these nozzles down at 600 knots, and it's almost like going into a brick wall. It's, the airplane slows down very, very quickly. If one had a, an enemy behind, if you came into the hover stop, we would slow down quicker than any other opening. So he would probably shoot, and you can get a shot. Vertical takeoff used to mean helicopters. With the advent of the Harrier, it meant planes as well. Now, in the 21st century, the fusion between the two has taken another twist, and a new vertical takeoff contender is born, the CV-22 Osprey. Using tilt rotor technology, it combines the speed, range, and fuel efficiency of a turboprop aircraft with the vertical takeoff landing and hover capabilities of helicopters. With a massive development budget and a whole lot of interest from the military, it looks like the CV-22 is set to be a prime mover on the digital battlefield.